welcome in this class we will study greenhouse effect and global warming now both of these are most commonly heard topics and a kind of simple topics but still very important topic specifically with the growing focus on environment and uh, the issues related to environment these topics have come into limelight now understanding first what is greenhouse effect now if i create an artificial glass chamber for plants to grow we call it a greenhouse now how does this greenhouse function what happens basically is you have the sunlight that comes in and that sunlight is in the form of short wavelength and when it goes out it's in the form of long wavelength now when i say short wavelength what does it imply that means that the waves are closer to one another and when i say long wavelength that means the waves are away from one another so when the waves are closer to one another that means it has more energy and there is more movement of the particle so the frequency is higher and there is more movement and since there is more movement of the particles what would happen the region with shorter wavelength would have higher energy on the other hand the region with longer wavelength what would happen here when the wavelength is longer there is lesser movement of the particles so there would be less energy that means when you have the short wavelength radiations that are coming onto the earth you have more energy that is coming in while the energy which is going out in the form of long wavelength would have less energy that means there would be a trap of energy so there would be a region which has more energy that is coming in and let's say less energy which is going out so this region which is left over is the energy trap and this energy trap creates a kind of heating effect and that heating effect would be known as the greenhouse so this is in simple terms how we understand the concept of greenhouse now this was first discovered by joseph fourier it was first experimented by john tendel and finally it was quantitatively measured by arrhenius now these are some of the facts and figures that you must know about greenhouse effect now when i say radiations from the sun are coming in i can say nearly 90% of the radiations that come in are in the form of visible light or infrared radiations of this 30% is absorbed so you have the albedo that is i can say 0.3% we have talked about this when we talked about insulation and the 70% goes back of this 70% i can say nearly 19% goes back to the atmosphere and 51% to land and water so this is a kind of basic distribution of greenhouse effect if you see so the amount of uh, radiations that are coming in and going out are divided proportionally based on the atmospheric uh, absorption and radiation now there are the some gases that predominantly help in the process of heating such gases are known as greenhouse gases the most common being carbon dioxide then you have methane you have sulfur dioxide nitrous oxide you have cfcs hydrofluoro hydrochlorofluorocarbons then you have perchlorofluorocarbons and so on so you have a long list of gases that act as greenhouse gas and those trap the energy and increase the uh, amount of heat that is present in the earth now uh, different uh, compounds have different ability to absorb the heat i can say if i do a comparatively a comparative analysis i can say nitrous oxide absorbs around 270 times more heat as compared to carbon dioxide so you have nitrous oxide absorption capacity is 270 times much higher than 
carbon dioxide that means if we are trying to curb on the pollution we must curb on nitrogen compounds first and then move to carbon dioxide the next major is methane which has absorption capacity of nearly 21 times to that of carbon dioxide so these two are the major gases you have the amount that is present now when we talk about greenhouse gases the proportion of gases in the atmosphere if we look on those figures we can see water vapor which is a main greenhouse gas contributes to maximum which is 36 to 70 percent of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere next comes carbon dioxide that contributes to 9 to 26 percent of the uh, greenhouse gases then you have methane at around 4 to 9 percent and finally the next one is ozone which is at around 3 to 7 percent of the total greenhouse gases that are present into the atmosphere now with these it's important to understand that water vapor is something that you cannot uh, change or reduce in the atmosphere but the next comes the carbon dioxide and therefore carbon dioxide is considered as one of the major greenhouse gases that should be controlled or that should be uh, uh, washed vigilantly as a result you have the major uh, protocols and summits that took place were in and around the carbon emissions and finally they talked about carbon trading which we have already covered in a different session now when we talk about sources which lead to greenhouse gases those can be natural sources or anthropogenic or i can say anthropogenic means man-made so human induced and natural sources so natural sources i can say water methane carbon dioxide ozone and nitrous oxide are some of the uh, gases which are released through natural sources that is through a volcanic eruption through the daily uh, cycling of uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange however there are some anthropogenic sources which are human induced which includes carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels you have methane which is mainly found in landfills then you have the termite guts paddy fields paddy or rice fields we can say then you have uh, the livestock farming so these are some of the major uh, places from where you have methane uh, that is released into the atmosphere then you have nitrous oxide nitrous oxide mainly from agricultural and industrial release so these are the major gases that lead to greenhouse effect now when there is greenhouse effect what ultimately happens is there is rise in the temperature and this rise in the temperature of the earth is known as global warming now what is the best thing to understand about global warming is we can measure global warming by an indicator which is known as gpw that's global warming potential now global warming potential is a relative measure of the amount of heat that is being trapped by the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and this compares the total heat which is trapped by some gases to the total amount of heat which could be trapped if there was carbon dioxide in place of that gas in, in place of that gas so for example if i say the gpw is 56 for say methane that means the methane traps around 56 times more heat as compared to the same mass of carbon dioxide now this gpw that's the global warming potential GWP is measured at 20 years, 50 years and 100 years period. So that varies from region to region and place to place the intensity of heating effect. Now this potential depends on three fundamental parameters. The first is the atmospheric life of the species that is living there, the absorption of the infrared rays and finally the location of the wavelength where the absorbed gas exists so these are the three major indicators that decide the global warming potential now next is causes of global warming now why the temperature is rising now the temperature is rising to some of the phenomena which are which can be again classified as human induced or natural phenomena so we have these phenomena which are anthropogenic again and these which are natural so let's talk about anthropogenic what happens if there is deforestation you would cut down 
uh, trees as we have discussed on the class on carbon trading once you cut down the trees what happened trees are the major absorbers of carbon dioxide or i can say trees act as carbon sinks and since you are cutting the trees and there are no more carbon sinks there would be more amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in technical terms we call this uh, we call this also as carbon dioxide emission then rise in the greenhouse gases that would lead to rise in the temperature definitely because they are able to trap more of the heat if there is higher uh, population then there would be more use of uh, fossil fuels there would be more use of electricity all those re process require heat to be released into the atmosphere uh, more of industries changes in the agricultural method we mainly focus on industrialization in agriculture uh, mechanization sorry mechanization in agriculture as well as the problem of excessive farming so these are some of the man induced causes of global warming now let's move on to some of the natural causes now these are very very important to understand the first is volcanic activity so what happens if there is a kind of volcanic eruption that takes place into a region the region where you have a kind of volcanic eruption would have higher temperature because of the release of gases into the atmosphere as a res result the temperature of that region would rise so volcanic activities affect global warming the next two important uh, the next two ones are very important to understand and a kind of bit conceptual so uh, be careful here now when we talk about sun spots basically you would have heard about a 11 year sun spot cycle where what happens is when sun gets hotter there are more sun spots that are seen those sun spots themselves are cool but they have a kind of hot bright patch that occurs around them and then that, that is known as fecula and if it's more than one we call it fecula so those are the hot patches that occur around the cold sun spots and we call those as fecula and this affect the brightness so what happens is because of this uh, you have the overall brightness that is increased and that brightness is increased to around nearly 0.1% in case of visible uh, wavelength but it could be much higher in case of ultraviolet radiations now what basically happened was during the period of 19, uh, 1645 to 1715 we call it the period of maunder minimum so this is a sunspot cycle which shows a period of maunder minimum where there was minimum sunspot activity and as a result this period was the period of little ice age similar to this there was another period which was known as dalton minimum this period started from 1795 ending to around 1825 this was again a period of cooler eruptions except one of the volcanic eruptions which was the tambora volcano in 1816 that happened and that led to rise in the temperature however otherwise it was more or less a kind of period of cooler eruptions or a cooler period the recent one we call it modern maximus is a kind of phase where the sun spot activities are at their peak so from 1950s to 2000 we have the highest sun spot activities that are visible in the region now there are kind of various activities that are seen as a result of this so let's talk about greenland since 2003 there has been a loss of nearly 600 trillion pounds per year of the ice from the greenland so what is happening based on that now let's work around the wobbly earth when we talk about wobbly earth what basically happens is you have towards the poles you have the ice caps now during the recent years what is happening is these ice caps are melting when these ice caps start melting what would happen the distribution of the weight of the earth would change so first thing that we need to understand uh, uh, under wobbling is change in the distribution of weight of earth because of the melting of ice the weight which was centered towards the pole would change first of all secondly 
This, this wobbling causes north pole and polar motion which is a kind of wobbling movement to change the course. So you can consider this as a kind of skater who is standing on one leg and one leg up and it's spinning. So what would happen there would be a change in the center of mass and the axis around which it is happening. So based on that you have the change in the distribution pattern based on two things that is firstly the melting of ice and secondly the polar motions that change and that causes wobbling which is again a major cause for the global warming to happen. So these are the major causes for global warming. Now next what are the impacts of global warming? As we can see it would lead to rise in the temperature. Since the temperature would rise there would be more melting of the ice. That melting of the ice would lead to increase in the sea level. So you have firstly the rise in the temperature. You have melting of ice. That melting of ice would lead to increase in the sea level. As a result there would be more storms and floods. More storms and floods will bring more havoc to the coastal area which will increase the uh, problems related to diseases. It would definitely impact the ocean. Since there would be storms and surges that would be coming in, it would affect the coastal and the marine life. However, the interior would suffer from droughts due to higher temperature. You would have deserts which would have uh, much severe consequences than expected. And finally, you would have the cold and warm gulf stream alternations that could happen. And that could lead to desalinization of the parts of Atlantic Ocean and this could be replicated in other areas where there is mixing of cold and warm currents. Again uh, to mention here some of the important impacts. In 2015 you had burning of fossil fuels by electricity which contributed for electricity which contributed to be the major proportion of emission in the United States. The second major was the use of transportation. Uh, so both of these need to be curbed which are worked out around the recent Kyoto protocols and the recent protocols that are coming up the Paris agreement. So uh, this was the basic idea to understand what is greenhouse effect and what is global warming. We would be covering few more important topics for environment in the subsequent lessons. You can subscribe to our channel for more updates. Have a good day ahead.